it's the year 2022. PlayStation have recently made some big changes to their PlayStation Plus with their new tier system with essential, extra and premium options. Premier tier subscribers have access to a catalogue of PS1, PS2 and PS3 classics as well as limited time game trials. For the next generation of PlayStation owners, Sony are looking at transforming the modern gaming customer experience, or in other words, the way gamers are regularly introduced to new titles, and then giving the ability to test out or even purchase and play the games they like, all using the technology available around us. And with the rise of the internet, the modern gaming customer experience has evolved for the better, with everything now available with the press of a button. But one might argue that it has lost some important qualities, as well as some of its unique aura along the way, especially for the PlayStation in particular. In fact, if you go back 20 years ago, the gaming customer experience was literally worlds apart. A pivotal shift from 2D to 3D gaming would hail in a golden era for gamers and the industry, but there was one commodity that would become the center point of the gaming experience during this time. During the 1990s and 2000s, Demon Discs were utilised by most major gaming consoles, but no gaming console was more synonymous with Demon Discs more than the PlayStation, and Sony's use of the Demon Disc helped in the PlayStation's rise to the top of the console wars, but as much as they were enjoyed by both casual and serious gamers alike, they would eventually fade into obscurity. So what exactly happened to Demon Discs? What made them so important for PlayStation, but also for gamers and the industry? And what was the callous responsible for its eventual downfall? Was it the internet, or is there more to the story? We'll look briefly into some important key moments to get some answers. September 1995 the PlayStation is launched in Europe and North America. With less than a year since its Japanese release, Sony took the PlayStation to foreign markets, having to compete with the two main console powerhouses at the time, Nintendo and Sega, game companies also from Japan. With both brands already well established in North America and Europe, Sony were the new kids on the block. But they were very confident in their console's potential, and were able to demonstrate this right away with a special disc, bundled free with all new PlayStation consoles. In North America, this was called PlayStation Picks, before later becoming the Interactive CD Sampler Disc, but if you lived in the power regions, this was known as Demo 1, when gamers had to rely mostly on in-store game kiosks and game rentals at the time, these helped introduce gamers to hot new games with limited gameplay, with the prospect that if you liked any of the games enough, you would go out to the store and pay your hard-earned money, or your parents' money, to buy the full-length titles. But Sony's demo disc idea wasn't exactly an original one. In the PC world, gamers were already familiar with this concept, as shareware or cover discs, ordered by phone and mail, were already commonplace. But for the home console world, a demo disc was a brand new revolutionary idea that no previous consoles had utilised up to that point, and these cutting edge CD consoles became the first to explore this new avenue. And while less known consoles like the 3DO system from Panasonic had entry level sampler CDs that tried to wow its consumers, Sega Saturns were a bundle of their own entry level disc called Sega Saturn Preview in Europe, or the bootleg sampler in North America. And for the Sony PlayStation, the PlayStation Pigs demo became the adequate starting point for those beginning their journey in North America. But things would be done much differently in the power regions, with Demo 1 pushing the boundaries of how a gaming console could look or sound like in the 1990s, and above all becoming more than just a sample platter with a bunch of cool games plastered onto a disc. When you boot up the disc for the first time, you literally see it in the opening video package, accompanied by the pumping techno music. It was hypnotic. You are literally being taken to another world. And if you've never ever played a PlayStation before in your life, then just like that, 
you're instantly hooked. And with the futuristic, trippy LSD visuals, you are presented with games like Crash Bandicoot, Tekken 2, Bridge Racer Revolution, Wipeout 2097, and even Die Hard Trilogy. Right out of the box, it offered something for everyone, but also gave you a place to roam and discover. Next thing you know, you're going around trying each game for hours and hours and pass, hoping to wring out every single last precious drop of gameplay until your time was up and it was game over. Then afterwards, wandering around some more, stumbling onto some trailers, then uncovering some nice surprises like the VCD, or messing with the interactive te demo of a vicious dinosaur, or a manta in the ocean. Demo One's visual design and presentation worked in entrancing gamers right away with a free roam theme park like experience that no other console on the market could replicate. This and other demo discs for the PlayStation became your golden ticket pass to the ever evolving PlayStation universe, all the while showing off the console's technological power and the games on offer, which would become key components for the PlayStation's initial success during the mid 1990s. March 1996, the PlayStation grosses over $2 billion in hardware and software sales. It not even been a year since Sony's debut game console was now in households worldwide, but more so its early dominance over both the Nintendo 64 and Sega Saturn became very evident. The PlayStation was now in high demand, having to ramp up CD production facilities, while the amount of console units being sold totaled over 4.3 million and the sheer amount of games being made annually was insane. At one point it was reported that approximately 400 PlayStation games were in development compared to the 200 Saturn and 60 Nintendo 64 titles. But Sony's ability to withstand the demand could largely be due to their decision to use the compact disc over the long-standing game cartridge format. While the use of game cartridges used primarily by Nintendo and Sega allowed for efficient loading times, durability, and piracy protection, the compact disc had larger memory space over its plastic counterpart, holding 650 megabytes of data, over 50 times more than the average cartridge, which could only hold 12 megabytes. Also, CDs allowed for better quality sound and more varieties in sound effects, with sound being sent straight to the TV as well as the sound chip. In coverages, all sound must be generated solely by the singular sound chip. Also, CDs and demo discs were cheaper and faster to mass produce, with thousands of copies being able to be made within a day, whereas cartridges took months to duplicate. This could be why Sega also made the transition from the cartridges of their past consoles to compact disc with their new Sega Saturn console, which was for a while looked upon as the direct competitor to the PlayStation throughout the 1990s. And although in Japan the battle between the PlayStation and the Saturn was neck and neck, some bad decisions on Sega's part led to the Saturn's downfall later on in the North American and European markets allowing Sony to take the lead. But perhaps where Nintendo and Sega both lacked the most, the PlayStation was able to thrive with the huge amount of third-party support from developers in Japan, Europe and North America. And this ultimately helped build the PlayStation's illustrious collection of classic titles. To its astonishing 7,918 game library during its 8 year lifespan, and with that, the PlayStation also threw around a crazy number of demo discs as well to cover all these releases. Packed them with trailers and bonus content, gave the PlayStation extra firing power over its competitors. On record, there have been over 932 PS1 demo discs released internationally with more still to be discovered. During the heyday of the PlayStation, there were demo discs for single titles, or collections of seasonal or monthly releases. On the base level, discs varied regionally with exclusives for Europe, Japan and Asia, North America or Australia and New Zealand. 
but for starters, there was the demo one shipped with new PlayStations. If you registered your new PlayStation console with Sony, you'd get a free demo disc called the Registered Users Demo. And then as you bought full version games, sometimes it would include a demo disc of an upcoming release or releases. Developers and publishers also put together demo disc compilations of their upcoming titles and would stash them inside other games or distribute them separately at trade events. Also, during this time, popular retail brands took notice of the PlayStation craze. Aside from the Jam Pack Volume series, which could be bought at most electronics and game stores in North America, Pizza Hut gave out steaming hot demo discs with their pizzas. McDonald's packaged their own demo discs alongside their promo meals. Also, Best Buy, Toys R Us, Pepsi, and even Ford have all etched their name onto a PlayStation demo disc. But more often than not, gamers likely got their hands on demo discs thanks to a certain medium. October 9, 1995. The first issue of the official PlayStation magazine is released in the UK one month after the PlayStation's UK and European release. Magazines were a major part of the gaming experience during this time, and they became a rite of passage. Once you were a full-fledged gamer, you need to go to your local bookstore, supermarket or newsstand, and get the latest PlayStation magazine, which you then take home, open it up, and read through the reviews, learn the gossip on rumoured titles, look at the cool pictures, and the cheat codes, all the cheat codes. But magazines provide the perfect platform to reach out to a large, passionate PlayStation fanbase, and what better way to showcase the games they had to offer by including demo discs with each issue. And these publications became the go-to source for gamers to try some exciting new games every month. In Europe, various countries had independent publications, such as Station Magazine in the UK, Next Station in Italy, and Dust Fun Magazine in Germany. But in 1995, the official PlayStation magazine, based in the UK, kicked off the famous Euro Demo lineup, which would be shared across all the different PAL territory variants of the official PlayStation magazine that would pop up in the years that followed. Meanwhile, in North America, the official US PlayStation magazine would first hit newsstands in October 1997 offering its own unique demo disc lineup. But months earlier that year, in March, the PlayStation Underground was established, the mail subscription service where gamers received regular issues of demo discs, packing in behind the scenes interviews, bulletins, and tons of other bonus content. This would take inspiration from Japan's own disc based service called Play Play PlayStation, first established in November 1995. Although the PlayStation in Japan had a short-lived official magazine from 1995 to 1999, Japanese gamers had the option of publications like Hyper PlayStation Remix or Dengeki PlayStation to get demo discs. Aesthetically, these official discs had noticeable differences depending on their region. The Euro demo discs from Powerline sported the crazy interfaces and background music, reflecting the popular underground club culture in Europe at that time. While North America opted for creatively animated full motion video overlays, with a more game-oriented background music approach, Japanese demo discs would also differ from its western counterparts, with colourful but simplified menus, often accompanied by mascots. Regardless, Demo discs oozed personality in one way or another, and they became valued collectibles for some. For those that didn't have the pocket money to afford the full length titles, demo discs were the next best thing. They were affordable, and there were more than enough gameplay for many. And perhaps this started to worry developers and publishers going into the future generations of gaming. But by the dawn of the new millennium, Demo discs had become the meta of the gaming industry, and they were everywhere. November 2000 The PlayStation 2 is launched in Europe and Australasia. In hopes of eclipsing the success of the original PlayStation, the PlayStation 2 would hit shelves, and for the next year go head to head against Nintendo and Sega's newest 6th gen consoles. 
in the Sega Dreamcast and the Nintendo GameCube. And Sony's demo disc formula remained the same for the PS2. In North America, gamers had either the 2.1, 2.2 or 2.3 version discs packaged alongside their brand new PlayStation 2s. And although these showed off the console's fun vibrant side, in the power regions however, things would be done differently the second time round, with consoles bundled alongside mysteriously black covered demo discs. These discs aesthetically mirrored the unusual PlayStation 2 ads that Sony were doing for magazines and TV at the time. And much like what Demo 1 did the generation before, it provided gamers with the free roam theme park like experience and showcased some of the tremendous games on offer. Airblade, Dark Cloud, Dota with Smackdown, Klonoa 2, this is Football 2002, and World Rally Championship. Then after browsing the games and trailers, you'd even find what is known as your basic, a software that allowed gamers to create their own computer programs in the basic programming language, all on your PlayStation 2. But this wasn't the only way to score a demo disc for your PlayStation 2 console. When registering your new console with Sony, you were given a free demo disc called Bonus Demo. Seasonal and monthly demo releases still existed, and some full vision titles included bonus playable demos, but more often they included bonus DVDs instead with trailers, previews, and other video content. There were demo discs for the console's new gameplay expansions for iToy, Sigstar, and multiplayer gaming. Select developers and publishers would still put together demo compilations. As for retail, with the momentum the PS2 was gaining, consumer brands would get behind the console, but would no longer ride the demo disc bandwagon like they did back with the PS1. Except for McDonald's in Japan, releasing their limited edition Happy Disc, containing McDonald's themed levels for both the Parapa the Rapper 2 and Ape Escape 2001 demos. Much like the PS1, the PlayStation 2 enjoyed a prosperous collection of demo discs, benefiting from Sony's strong third-party support. The number of demo discs released for the console would climb well over the 1,400 mark internationally. And to withstand the substantial increase in graphic scale of its games, the PlayStation 2 slowly shifted from the CD-ROM discs with the blue bottom utilised for its earlier titles to the new DVD format, the silver bottom. DVDs now supported the 480p to 720p resolutions and held 4.7 gigabytes of memory for a single layer, or 8.5 gigabytes for a dual layer. This gave even more technological freedom for developers, while still keeping mass production very cost effective for Sony. And as for magazines, regular demo discs for the PS2 were now distributed exclusively through either the multiple PAL country variants of the official PlayStation 2 magazine or the official US PlayStation magazine in North America and Dangeki PlayStation in Japan had moved on to covering PS2 content. In the power regions, the official PlayStation 2 magazine stuck to a simple and clean but contemporary interface for their demos and were now incorporating behind the scenes videos, movie and DVD trailers as well as save files. In North America, the PlayStation Underground service from the PS1 era would merge itself with the official US PlayStation magazine in 2001. And with the magazine's demo discs now being distributed under the PlayStation Underground name, they carried over some of its look and presentation with its animated theme menus, behind the scenes interviews, import game showcases, and cheat codes. In Japan, Dengeki PlayStation demo discs retain some of their previous aesthetic, but focus more on information and advertising with interesting additions like music playlists or voice clip galleries, and contain ridiculously large libraries of saved data files, usually with over 100 saves per demo. Overall, PS2 demo discs abandoned the visually over-the-top nature of its PS1 predecessors for a more user-friendly and intuitive approach, all the while incorporating the same usual content of playable demos, trailers, and save files, but were now finding ways to add in spicy new bonus content. 
the PlayStation 2 would become the best-selling video game console of all time, with over 154.4 million units sold worldwide, and helped further skyrocket Sony ahead in the console wars. And although not the most powerful console on the market, the PlayStation 2 still proved too great against Nintendo and Sega, who simply couldn't compete with the PS2's fantastic 10,035 game library, as well as its utility as a DVD disc player, and with its backwards compatibility with PS1 games. But Sony would eventually be met with a new formidable challenger. November 2001 the Xbox is launched in North America. PC juggernaut Microsoft would join in the home console war with their new Xbox console, boasting nearly double the memory and processing power of the PlayStation 2. At the time, Sony were experimenting with the online network functionality for some of their PS2 titles. But with Microsoft's proven experience and expertise in the PC world, the key selling point for the Xbox was enabling online and multiplayer functionality in its games far beyond what any home console had done before. And in 2002, Microsoft's answer would come in the form of Xbox Live, a subscription-based service that delivered an all-in-one online social experience with friend lists, voice chat, online functionality for games, and downloadable content. The Xbox was able to sell a total of 24 million units, outperforming the Sega Dreamcast and Nintendo GameCube. But two couldn't keep up with the PlayStation 2's strong campaign. In fact, Microsoft lost money with the Xbox, but it laid down the necessary groundwork for their follow-up console. The Xbox 360 First launched in North America, November 22nd, 2005. And with the introduction of the Xbox 360, Microsoft made Xbox Live the central focus for the console, which was now required for online gaming, and also introduced a multitude of innovative features. One of the most important of these was the Xbox Live Marketplace, where gamers could purchase full-length games and download demos online. And the Xbox 360 not only proved to be a game-changer for Microsoft in the console war, but it also set the standard for the next generation of gaming, putting pressure on Sony to take action with the next console. November 2006 The PlayStation 3 is launched in Japan and North America. With the overwhelming success of their previous two consoles, combined with the growing competition from Microsoft, Sony really had to hit their next console out of the ballpark but had to begin exploring the online capabilities in their games, as well as within the console itself. This marked the birth of the PlayStation Network, and through this they created PlayStation Home, a virtual 3D social platform where you control your own avatar, and the PlayStation Store, offering PlayStation gamers their own method to carefully browse games, download trial versions, and purchase them online. Sony's vision also introduced significant changes with games and demos now requiring hard drive installation before being played. And consoles came equipped with built-in Wi-Fi internet and Bluetooth, plus state-of-the-art disk drives that not only supported backwards compatibility with PS1 and PS2 games, but also supported the new Blu-ray disc format. While Blu-rays range between 25GB of storage for a single layer, to 50 gigabytes for dual layers, and now support a 1080p high definition picture and audio. This came with some pros and cons, meaning that PS3 games were no longer region locked like the previous PlayStations, but ultimately the addition of all these flashy new features inflated the manufacturing costs of the console, setting a high price point at launch upsetting consumers. Then over the next few years, developers struggled to wrap their heads around the PS3's complex cell architecture with devoted PlayStation third-party companies now branching out towards the Xbox as an additional platform. And with the increasing size and graphic scale of games being made at the time, development now demanded bigger budgets, more resources, and more time from developers to produce games. 
As a result, the sheer number of PS3 game releases would only reach half the numbers of the PS1 and PS2. But more importantly for demo discs, costly network trafficking and licensing fees saw publishers see less worth than making demos altogether, both physical and online. Over the PS3's 8 year tenor, the North American PlayStation Store had the largest catalogue with 235 demos and time trials, while there's believed to be fewer than 147 physical demo discs made internationally so far on record. The PlayStation 3 would offer bundled playable demos inside what was called the Special Demo Disc alongside new consoles, but only in Japan. As for other regions, they wouldn't get this same luxury unlike previous generations. Instead, in North America, consoles came with a Blu-ray disc either called Play Beyond or Welcome to the PlayStation and PlayStation Network, packed in with movie and gameplay trailers. The redundancy of demo discs for the PlayStation platform began to show itself. Despite physical demo discs still in production for very select titles, as well as the new PlayStation Move accessory, and a few publisher and developer demo collections still being made. And interestingly enough, some Blu-ray movies coming equipped with bonus PS3 demo discs. But for PlayStation's gaming magazines, the landscape would change as the internet eventually crept its way to the forefront. In North America, the official US PlayStation magazine would be discontinued in January 2007. However, long-time independent PlayStation magazine, PSM, would take over the reins, becoming PlayStation, the official magazine, in December 2007. Meanwhile, in Japan, Dengeki PlayStation would also make the transition from PS2 to PS3 content. These regions would no longer distribute any monthly playable demo discs through magazines, except for in the power regions, where the various country variants of the official PlayStation 2 magazine were rebranded to just simply PlayStation official magazine, filled by the country name, and had their obscure lineups of Blu-ray discs, each with playable demos. However, the UK magazine would have the longest standing tenor with a monthly lineup of over 70 Blu-ray discs from July 2007 until June 2013. However, complications with PS3's firmware made many of these regular demo discs simply unplayable and a headache for gamers unless the correct firmware update was installed, if you could get your hands on one. Ultimately, physical magazine sales would slowly begin to decline during the 2000s, and although some publications would continue implementing strictly trailers, reviews and wallpapers on regular discs, magazines would eventually phase out their demo disc distribution by the beginning of the 2010s. This became the final nail in the coffin, putting an end to the gaming industry's reliance on demo discs for good. The industry was now fast moving towards the future, and that future was the internet, opening up new ways for gamers to experience regular gaming content. June 29, 2010. It would take four years into the PlayStation 3's lifespan for Sony to introduce PlayStation Plus, a paid subscription that would offer perks such as PlayStation Store discounts but also a handful of free monthly games consisting of PS3, PS1, and a couple of PlayStation Mini titles as well. Countries from the power regions, Asia, North America, and Japan all had their own PS Plus game lineups. With some adjustments, Sony were slowly getting back on track in the console war, while the PlayStation Plus would carry over to Sony's next generation console, the PlayStation 4 first released in North America November 15, 2013. And the PS3's free monthly game lineups for the PS Plus would slowly be phased out for a selection of free PS4 and Vita titles. And then in 2014, Sony would introduce PlayStation Now, a separate subscription service that gave players access to a library of over 100 streamable PS3 titles before eventually expanding to PS2 and PS4 titles as well. By the end of the 2010s, Sony decided to fully embrace the new paid subscription business model, alongside other brands like the Nintendo Switch Online and the Xbox Live Game Pass, with these subscriptions now being required for online multiplayer gameplay. 
but also spiritually replacing the way demon discs of the past used to introduce new titles. Now with their monthly game lineups and catalogs, all free to download and play. These subscriptions now combine with the multiple ways brands utilize the internet and social media, shape the modern gaming custom experience of today. With the PlayStation 4, the last remnants of physical demo discs lies within the PlayStation VR demo. And while demos are still downloadable via the PlayStation Store, but only for select titles, larger scale games with online multiplayer also offer beta tests used for identifying bugs and testing out the multiplayer network traffic for the developers, but also serving as demos with gameplay available for gamers within a set time frame. Plus, gaming companies are now using much more controlled marketing campaigns for their releases, leveraging the influence power of social media, live streaming, and YouTube for trailers, gameplay demos, and reviews. For PlayStation especially, they broadcast their highly anticipated State of Play presentations throughout the year, showcasing future games and projects. All of these resources now give gamers plenty of great insight into making a decision on whether or not to go ahead and purchase a game. June 2022, and now jumping to the present day, with Sony now currently in an interesting period, with the PlayStation 4's dominant reign heading into its ninth year, while the PlayStation 5, released back in 2020, is still in its early stages, but they are gearing up big for their next generation with the all-new PlayStation Plus, merging the features of PlayStation Now into a new tier-based subscription system that still offers a selection of free PS4 and PS5 monthly games with the essential tier, but also now with potentially hundreds of titles and game trials now only fingertips away inside the extra and premium tiers. Depending on your price range, this provides gamers multiple ways to explore and trial the PlayStation's library games from past and present, with traces of the experiences from previous PlayStation demo discs. With what we have now from Sony, as well as from Microsoft and Nintendo, it will be interesting to see how the modern gaming customer experience could evolve from here, and what could be brought to the table next in the generations to come. And with all that said, the era of demo discs is now very much behind us, but the market made on the industry, and the groundwork it left for PlayStation in particular, can definitely still be felt in today's gaming. And more importantly for gamers, the value that demo discs provided was not only in the games, trailers, or even the discs themselves, but also in the gaming experience that was centered around them. That unforgettable feeling of opening up a fresh demo disc after buying your new console, or from those monthly magazines, or even from your McDonald's combo, and then booting it up and bring an immersive, interactive theme park to life on screen, with multiple games to play and places to explore, is something that today's gaming can't replicate. And nobody did this better than the PlayStation demo discs. Hey, if you made it this far into the video, just want to say thank you so much for watching. Uh, this project was a bit different from what I normally do. Just wanted to try pay tribute a little bit to a fun part of my gaming upbringing and learn a thing or two myself about demo discs. But let me know what you thought in the comments. If you want to follow more of my content about fighting games, retro PlayStation games, and RPGs sprinkled in with some music and travel then you can find me on Twitch, Twitter, and here on YouTube. But regardless, this is Daz signing out. Just want to say thanks again. Take it easy, guys. Stay safe, and I'll see you fellas in the next one. Eh?